Okay. So we're going to jump into it here, guys. I just want to respect your time here. So um, super pumped to do this. This is, I think it's really good timing for, for everyone to get through this as well. And obviously with the season coming up, um, one of the most important things when it comes to uh, performance in really any sport, but if something is with the duration that uh, marathon and ultras and tries all that, all that good stuff is going to be going to be nutrition, but just to jump into this a bit here. So for just to kind of go through my idea of a presentation, I'm going to read parts of the uh, parts of the presentation. I'm not here just to read for you guys. Um, I'll kind of leave that to you, but uh, I'll be reading the most important parts and ad-libbing most of it. So um, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Troy Borg. I'm a sports nutritionist with the uh, certified by the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Uh, there's only 26 of us actually in Canada at uh, last count. Um, also have uh, advanced certifications in metabolic analysis, among other nutrition uh, certifications with the Clean Health Institute and also with Precision Nutrition. Um, I've been involved in this space for almost 30 years now. I've got to update this a bit. Um, as part with the facility that we have here in Sudbury, the VO2 peak, we get into uh, we get into things a little bit deeper than most with uh, VO2 max testing and uh, resting metabolic rate analysis. Because I want to make sure that you as an athlete, just we don't have any stone unturned when it comes to your performance. So when it comes to nutrition, in specifically when it comes to performance nutrition with running, it's... I think it's really an important thing to really understand whatever our endeavors are, we should be trying to find how we can get the most out of that. And nutrition is going to be one of those things that, uh, that we can really see a giant benefit from in when, in terms of, of performance. So today we're going to be covering a few things like the calories and macros along with uh, some of the micronutrients, some of the most uh, ones that you, you, I feel would be most uh, beneficial for Hydration, we're going to spend a bunch of time on that. And then also with supplementation and uh, meal timing. So let's just get into it here. One really important note is that um, runners who fuel will finish. And just because those of you that have raced marathons and ultras and that kind of stuff, um, you, you're going to understand this better than most. And with the high demands comes a high demand of fuel. So without properly fueling, obviously, just like your car, it's not really going to matter. You're, if you run out of fuel, you're not going to perform your best, let alone finish. So what we see here that is that um, on a poll that was taken, 90% of racers do understand that, the, that nutrition does play an important role, but crazy stat that only 36 to 53% of racers um, – or sorry, of some racers only consume 36 to 53%, I should say, of what the energy expenditure happens during a race. So by closing the gap of what we really need when it comes to, um, to anything, uh, especially in a race, closing the nutritional gap, so the calorie demand of what we have is going to be very important for, for us to be able to, uh, to finish those, those events. And the more we can better understand that the better decisions we can make when it comes to uh, uh, performance and uh, nutrition. So this is something I want to touch on. Hopefully you guys can see this. Okay. I'm going to minimize this. So fat versus carb utilized. So CHO is carb is uh, how we're going to short form carbohydrate for our presentation here. So this is someone's VO2 max test that, uh, that I had performed. And we're just going to go over this pretty briefly. I just want to get you guys to really understand the importance of carbohydrates in terms of you finishing a race, uh, let alone performing well. So the dark green line here, this is fat utilization. This line here um, is going to be someone's uh, heart rate, so the, in the subject's heart rate. This teal line is going to be the carb utilization that someone that this person in particular, because everyone is very different when it comes to what happens here. So <clears throat> we can see with their heart rate, the lower the heart rate for most people, the higher the amount of fat gets utilized as a substrate. So as an energy source, 
Now, why that is so important is that where we use the most fat would mean typically that we're going to use the less amount of carbohydrate. And if any of you have bonked during a race, um, you'll understand kind of the idea behind there, or even just the idea of just performing well, or sometimes maybe if your legs have felt very heavy, um, carbohydrate under consumption can really contribute to that. So if we go by what we have here, we can see that uh, where they have their peak fat utilization, so here's their peak fat, and we can see their carb utilization here, uh, this individual would be better suited to probably race a long distance um, at this space right here. But not really getting too deep into that, we can see as their heart rate increases, we can see their carb utilization goes up. So it's not uncommon to see someone obviously to have a, a heart rate. If most of you have been tracking your heart rate, if not, I really suggest you know, for performance, you, you really jump on that. Um, to see heart rates, 150, 160, and sometimes even higher, but getting into the between 140 to 160 is very, very common when it comes to most racers. So we can see this person with, we see a dramatic spike of that carb utilization at 160, but we can see the difference here of, uh, of that carb utilization. So we see them dropping off in fat utilization. And we see that as their carb utilization goes up, this is kind of where it's so important to learn how to fuel effectively, especially with carbohydrates, as your race goes on, because the harder you push, then the more you're going to use carbohydrates. And it's just going to get to a point where you're just not going to be able to fuel fast enough. And we're going to discuss reasons why that, uh, that might go on. So issues with fueling when it comes to, uh, to running, a lot of times it just goes to really... Um, limited understanding of, uh, of the topic. So just the demands of the sport nutritionally, what we're going to cover a lot of today. And then we get into just because you need to consume so much, there could be some uh, GI distress that happens. And just from a lot of different reasons, again, that we're going to discuss really soon. Um, and then the inconsistent timing of fluid and hydration at checkpoints, you know, sometimes if you're going by that checkpoint, you just might not feel like it's time or you just weren't thinking clearly, you didn't grab fluid or you didn't grab enough um, pack weight during races with some of you that might use the, the camel packs. Um, you might want to not care. Some people don't carry it because of the weight. And then one of the biggest things here, a couple of the biggest reasons here are going to be past experiences, both positive and negative when it comes to how you fueled in the past. We, we kind of go to the well of what has worked for us and we try to stay away from what doesn't, but seldom do we really take a look at why something was a negative experience and try to fix that of whatever that reasoning was. And also on the positive experiences. Now, a lot of times we'll see finish uh, people finish. I, I should say, almost in spite of what they've done, maybe not because of what they've done. So we get into this idea of, 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 you know, this is just what I've done in the past, so I'm just going to keep doing that. Instead of really trying to learn and tweak things to try to have a more positive uh, environment for you to perform even better. Um, changes in race palatability. We see this happen often where you just, when it comes to the, like the, the goo or even just trying to uh, consume enough carbohydrates going through the race, you just, you just kind of get over it. You just get that, um, that diet fatigue of just not willing, or you just don't want to consume that type of food anymore. So the, the idea of sweet versus savory uh, when it comes to, to the calories really does change things. And it's something that happens as the race goes on, especially if you do consume a lot of carbohydrates throughout, to, throughout the race. And this is probably one of the biggest ones where instead of really whether it's reaching out to someone like me or someone else that's a sports nutritionist, um, you just sort of latch on to what other people have done. So you kind of talk to your friends or maybe some of you're competing with or against, however you want to put it. And you just get the idea of, okay, well, so-and-so competed really well. So I want to do what they did, but they might not be doing something that's really optimal even for them, let alone for you. So when it comes to GI distress in running, this is super common and it's something that some of you have probably gone through. Um, we see that 30 to 50% of runners have had GI distress. I don't know if any of you have really experienced that, 
but of course there's going to be um, a reduction in performance. If you're jacked up and your you know, upper GI is cramping and that kind of stuff, whether it's nausea or just being uncomfortable, you know, that just starts the, the, the trend of not performing very well or in unfortunate cases of just not finishing. So there's a lot of contributing factors to why that GI distress is going to happen, including just reduced blood flow. So what happens, and we notice this with um, SMO2 monitors, so it's um, muscle oxygen uh, saturation monitors, is that we start to see blood getting pulled away because it's got to go towards working muscles. So it kind of even gets dumped from, we'll call them non-working muscles or not as working muscles and gets dumped into working muscles. But because the demand for oxygen and to clear waste products is such a high level and consistent level, then blood flow from the gut so gets cut off and then that can start that chain reaction of the GI distress. And then also with dehydration is, can also be a cause. And then um, you, you'll see that uh, the rise in body temperature as you continue, continually push yourself will slow down that stomach emptying. So it gets harder and harder for you to maintain, even if you are consuming enough uh, food, for you to actually metabolize that and get rid of it and use it um, effectively. And everyone's going to be different. And this is going to be for a variety of reasons as well. That's why it's so hard and why it's so important to experiment with things well before an important event. Because everyone is so different. GI symptoms are going to be different from person to person. And then, of course, it's going to be influenced by genetics. The, if you had any gut training, as I like to call it, to try to consume enough of the carbohydrates that you're going to be doing it, if your gut bacteria has changed, if there's been any intolerances, maybe you just decide to eat so much of you know X food that we're going to get into a whole bunch. But if you just decide to stick to one food and your tolerance to that is only so high, and if you start to consume so much of it, then we, you're probably going to run into to issues. And then what happens with many people is because they don't really, you know, train their guts uh, when it comes to consuming a high level of carbohydrates is that um, you run into GI discomfort. And even though we know that fueling is going to help you perform well, um, you can only take that so far and then it's just going to get uncomfortable. And many people just, that's going to be so different from person to person is, uh, and, and the issue there is that, uh, of course, we know it's going to help you with your race, but it, it could also, we have to find that line with not crossing it to cause any uh, GI discomfort. So nutritional considerations here, there's a whole, again, everyone is different and we all have to kind of take our own notes when it comes to this. So training status, like how, what kind of condition are you in? What condition have you been in? How long have you been running for? Have you done that event before the same terrain? There's so much that really, really matters. Um, what your daily energy expenditure currently is, your body composition, specific training goals. Like there's so much that goes on here that we really have to think really individualized on how you're going to be affected when it comes to your uh, your personal uh, nutrition. So why it's so hard to try to take someone else that maybe that is a racer because you don't know if they've had a very specific plan really optimized for them. And they might be a complete different runner than you and not take advantage of the same, the same aspects that they've maybe that they've done. So why it's so important to try to maximize the fuel economy. So just really thinking about carbon, we're talking a ton about carbohydrates today. Now, pre, pre-exercise carbohydrates going to uptake or going to facilitate the uptake of glucose because your body knows that it's going to continually kind of get this sort of system flush of, uh, of carbohydrates come in and it's going to suppress the hepatic uh, system here of you kind of emptying your muscles and your liver. We're going to try to hang on to that for as long as you can, because going back to that thinking, going back to that slide of you using the, the carbohydrates uh, as an energy source. Well, if you can have some in your, in your bloodstream, so your body can see that we, we have that pool consistently coming in. It's not going to rely on, on stored carb, uh, carbohydrates as glycogen as much as if it didn't. So if you don't have it within that bloodstream and you're consuming it or not consuming it, I should say, 
and it's going to have to rely on your gas tank uh, of glycogen, and it's going to empty that fairly quickly. And this is also going to uh, mitigate the risk of hypoglycemia, so just drop in blood sugar. So the, the more you can keep, find your, your balance of what you can tolerate with your performance to try to avoid the hyperglycemia. I don't know if any of you had that sugar crash, um, but it's not fun and let alone during a race just at any time, but the amount of performance you're going to lose because of it is going to be pretty substantial for most of us. So again, we just want to preserve that stored glycogen because we, we just want to hang on to that gas tank for as long as we possibly can. So considerations for female athletes, now, this is something that we don't really speak a lot of, and we're not going to really dive tons in. Um, there's just a couple of, of points to really, really be mindful of. Estrogen is, again, as a new female, of course, you're going to know, is um, primarily serves a development for female secondary sex char characteristics, but it's also linked to enzymes in energy metabolism. So got the long story short here is what we see in some research is that some let like some women in this one study that uh, 30 they you should increase your calories by upwards of 34 percent to try to get the same glycogen being stored as your male counterparts so that's that can be a substantial amount of calories especially if you're not used to consuming them so i always suggest to try to start low when it comes to any of those things of consuming more food, but we'll get into that in, in just a second here. So just keep in mind that estrogen can play a factor when it comes to you trying to load for your, your glycogen uh, intake. So we're going to go through different loading protocols for different kind of scenarios. Hopefully we're going to put this up on, um, on uh, YouTube. So hopefully if you guys don't, catch everything don't worry about it you can always kind of skim through once we load it up on uh, on youtube <clears throat> so between carbs and protein we're not going to speak a lot about fat and i'll get into why that we're not really going to do that too too much um is that we see that outside of calories it's not going to aid our performance nearly as much and actually it could be kind of a detriment because of its effect on on the gut but with typical loading kind of it normally ha like when it comes to carbohydrate loading happens after a depletion phase so we try to deplete the body of glycogen so then we're going to uptake even more because we see that during after i should say after a depletion phase that there is a better uptake in carbohydrates so it's the body sees that depletion we start consuming more carbohydrates it wants to uptake more of it because it sees that as a bit of an issue when we start to deplete it too much because it's kind of like the, the primary gas tank for hard endeavors. So we want to make sure that that is filled up almost all the time, especially for, for you runners. So carbohydrate consumption is going to be between 5 to 12 grams per kilo of body weight per day um, with the higher end, you know, the 8 to 10 and higher uh, reserved for uh, eight to 10 grams per kilo per day, I should say, um, for being at uh, greater than 70% of your VO2 max. You can find online calculators and see what that looks like for you. Everyone's very different. Um, and then also to know exactly what that is to get tested is going to be your, your most uh, effective idea here. And most of you runners are going to be going at probably 12 hours or more when it comes to training for uh, a marathon. Now, with the idea of how we're going to time some of this, we see that within 30 minutes, by consuming 0.6 to 1 gram per, uh, per kilo of body weight is going to really help the, uh, the, the reloading phase. The sooner you can get on reloading a glycogen, the better. So what this would look like for me, so if I just use the, the, the top part here just to keep the math simple, um, I'm about 93 kilo right now, 94 on a not so good day. So within 30 minutes of finishing any glycogen depleting exercise, but let's just, for instance, here for, for running, I would consume almost a hundred grams of, uh, of carbohydrates within that time frame. <clears throat> and I know some of these numbers seem like they're a lot, right? So some of the numbers that we're going to get into are going to seem like they're like, holy moly, that's a lot, but just think of 
how much fuel you really burn during some of these training sessions, let alone a race. So digging into more of the glycogen loading for every two hours for the next four to six hours, 1.2 grams of carbohydrates um, should be consumed. That's, that should, should be, should be consumed. Um, it's to continually kind of feed so your body has enough time to process uh, the carbohydrates that you're consuming and try to upload that as much as possible to try to fill up as fast as you can within reason. Um, so you can try to fill up that, that tank and keep it full. Now, what we see here when in terms of protein is something, uh, I love this term of protein pacing. Now, 20 to 40 gram doses within one hour of waking, then every three hours until three hours of bedtime. It's just kind of like a rule of thumb to be able to ensure that you're consuming enough protein for your, uh, for your training. And we'll get into how much that you should be consuming. But I feel especially runners is one thing that protein should be consumed to, to ensure that you're going to be recovering from some of those runs to hopefully avoid more damage than is necessary when it comes to the training that you're going to be going under. Now, with that being said, we think about a, a low FODMAP diet, and we're, I'll, I've got a, a grouping here of what uh, what that looks like for you, like a, a list of foods. That's just going to help maybe reduce some of the GI distress. And if it's not a problem, and this is one thing that I really want to hit to hit home, if something isn't a problem, then it isn't a problem. If you operate well under whatever constraints or whatever food that you're you're eating, don't worry about just jumping to a low, low FODMAP just because I said so. If there is an issue when it comes to your, your intake, then for sure, I would make sure that you try to, outside of the list that I'm going to be providing to you, that you uh, you do what you can to try to consume that to, to best it to your ability. <clears throat> so things like what we have here when it comes to, to carbohydrates of carrots, grapes, or great, I think I said cakes, carrots, grapes, orange, strawberries, and so on here. Um, when it comes to your carbohydrate sources, protein, typically protein isn't going to be that big a deal. A lot of times it's some of the seasonings or some of the marinades that we'll, uh, we'll use could be an issue. Then we have a listing here, short list here of uh, high FODMAP diets, uh, high FODMAP foods, I should say. Um, so if anything might be causing some issues, so if you are running and you're upping your carbohydrates, you might want to pull back and jump into some, maybe some more of these as, as a source instead of maybe something that you have been using when it comes to a carbohydrate source. So exploring nutrient timing. Now there's going to be a progression of things that matter a lot. So the things that matter the most when it comes to your performance nutrition is going to be the total amount of calories you consume in a day. If you under consume for too long, your, your performance will suffer. If, and that's just because you just don't have enough nutrients, whether it's macro or micro to, to help facilitate your performance. And that's something that's going to be really important. So if you continually under consume calories, it's going to cause a problem. Then the other side to that is, uh, just on the calorie side, then of course, for, for you guys, the carbohydrates, if you're not consuming enough, that's going to be again, a, a problem, an issue with performance. But to be able to train yourself to consume more carbohydrates, so when it comes to race day, that you can consume more to be able to, again, train that gut to be able to uh, get a little bit more out of your, your body. And then consuming enough protein is going to be very valuable to make sure that you don't break down tissue as much as you should to be able to recover and possibly not get as sore as well. So if you're not doing... If you're not getting enough protein, enough carbs, enough calories in this case, and of course, fat does play a role, but if you're not getting enough of those, timing your nutrients just isn't really going to matter. So we have to kind of fill that cup first. So we have to, the daily amounts, we have to think about that number one. So when it comes to just daily requirements of calories each day, this is just like on a regular day. So let alone a race day. So on a daily basis, we're looking at, um, so I put as a 150 pound or 68 kilo um, example here, carbohydrates 
typically seven to 10. Again, we've seen it from five to 12. Um, protein, 1.3 to 2.1 grams per kilo. And then fat, one to 1.5 grams per kilo. So if we kind of take a look here, we can see that um, for the total amount of calories, so we have the calories here, uh, always start on the lower end and then work your way up. Again, kind of think of it like medication where you're not going to just start on the most maximal dose and then hope for good things to happen. You would typically start on the lowest dose that should make sense for your situation when it comes to whatever ailment that you might be trying to treat. Well, when it comes to calories and carbohydrates and, uh, and, really, and really fat, try to start on the lower end, then slowly work your way up. Kind of the asterisk here is I would recommend trying to get to your protein the higher end as quick as you can to really mitigate some of that muscle soreness and to help you recover better so you can get stronger and better for, for some of your runs. So again, th uh, 38 to 63, uh, we're just going to short form this to, to calories per, uh, per kilo of body weight. So for this individual, we're looking at 68 kilos. So we're looking at to start off with 25, uh, 2,584 calories to 4,284 calories. And then we can see the ranges here. I know they look like gigantic ranges, right? But again, everyone's so different. Everyone's tolerance is so different. So that's why we can't just say specifically eat this because everyone's requirements are on a spectrum. If there's no, when it comes to sports nutrition, very seldom is it just a hyper-specific answer to whatever that goal is without knowing your situation your volume, your previous tendency, your current diet. There's just so many pieces there that without knowing that, we just won't know how to help you best. So there's no hard and fast. It's this number and that's it. I hope that makes sense. <clears throat> so again, going back to the glycogen depletion can be a really valuable piece here. And the reason for it is, again, to help upload more glycogen when it comes time to, to load. So we typically do that depletion. I don't know if any of you have gone through that before, but um, three or four days before you get into carb loading to prime prime that phase. Um, a lot of times we'll get into zone four intervals. You don't, and this is kind of the thing, you don't have to do this with running. This is where you can do other activities. So zone four, um, we're looking at harder, longer intervals, not extremely hard, but we're looking at a part of your training that's where you can kind of maintain a pretty, most people anywhere from five to 10 minutes, sometimes a lot longer, but to help us deplete that glycogen. So longer intervals to help deplete that, or just a longer run and just not refueling to, to help, um, to help mitigate the amount of carbohydrates that you're going to be consuming. So this is one of those things that are going to be very highly variable. So everyone's super different when it comes to glycogen depletion and feeling as good as you can going through that. Some people like doing sort of a keto style approach where you eat a maximum of 50 grams of carbohydrates a day. Some like to go with a 50 to 150 grams of non-keto. So this is kind of what we class as low carb between 50 to 150 grams of uh, carbs a day while going through the depletion phase of training. And then some people just depending on how much, how many calories they're consuming, they'll go by a 10% uh, or even less uh, when it comes from calories coming from carbohydrates. So, and there's many different variations of this. Now a drop variation is you're eating so many, let's just say you're eating 500 grams of carbohydrates because you're training really hard. And then you just drop it down to whatever, 50 grams. Some people prefer that. Some people prefer more of a step method where you're consuming less and less each, each day, getting down to a very minimal amount. And then you start to work your way back up. <clears throat> Everyone's very different. Now, I'm not a giant fan of just jumping down to the 50 grams. I'm more of a fan of the, the step method and us kind of dropping them kind of in order where a certain percentage, depending on how much you're, you're consuming, but to drop it so much per day to get you down to a pretty minimal amount to avoid that keto flu. I don't know if any of you have consumed low carbs for a longer period of time, but you get flu-like symptoms, which is kind of crazy. 
And uh, because of that switch in what's happening with when it comes to substrate utilization, and then the fatigue and the weakness that kind of come along with that. So we try to mitigate that as much as possible. So again, everyone's very different. So how you approach it might be very different than how I would approach it. Uh, carb loading, this is like the fun time. So carb loading, you basically, I'm not going to say all bets are off, but man, you really, it's its probably a good time here. For for any athlete that has been depleted, this is the where the rubber meets the road. But also very important to have that prior high carb intake because uh, this is where some people do begin that, to get some uh, GI distress. So you would use about another three or four days to reload before the event <clears throat> to make sure that your um, your glycogen stores are as full as they can be and you've sort of began the, the, the uh, or restarted the idea of consuming a ton of carbohydrates to retrain the system to make it easier for you to consume more during the race. <clears throat> so this is where you would, very limited training. Um, some people like to do just like walking, that kind of stuff, even a few days before a race, probably not recommended that you try and, you know, blow the wheels off. Um, so higher calorie, again, especially for some, maybe some of you women to try to consume even more calories, but higher carbs for sure. So we're looking at five to 12 grams per, per kilo, kind of on the recommendations from before. Everyone's different. Don't start too high um, to, to make sure that you would try to, again, avoid that distress. And to try to divide your carbohydrates evenly throughout the day. So not to have like a little bit, then a ton, and then kind of go back and forth. Just try to keep it as even keel as possible to try to make it um, a little bit more favorable for, for your body to uh, to, to consume that. Um, again, the asterisks here stay to the higher side of, of, uh, of protein. And the one thing here that's really going to be important, when you're ramping up carbohydrates, to be mindful of how much fiber you're going to be consuming. So foods lower in fiber are going to be your friend. Now with recommendations that we'll get into when it comes to, to fiber, but if you're consuming a lot of fiber, we all know what fiber can do, especially if you're not used to consuming it. So, uh, or into those kinds of really higher amounts that you might be when you start to load. So this is where it's going to be really important to try to figure out foods that are going to be really beneficial for you that could be higher in carbohydrates, but also lower in fiber. And then we also see that uh, combining carbohydrates and protein together seems to have a favorable um, have a favorable uptake when it comes to storing more glycogen. So, thinking of what a race day might look like here, <clears throat> when it comes to um, your race recommendations of per per hour, so. We're looking this the example here is someone that's going to run a 430 marathon time. Well, I don't know what some of your times are. I know some of you are really good runners, but to think about per, calories per hour. So we're looking at about 150 to 400 calories per hour. So thinking of the the chart that I showed you of the carb utilization, <clears throat> the the that one individual at 160 beats per minute would have to consume about 300 calories. Uh, per hour to maintain their carbohydrate stores just to meet the demand. So for some, that might be really easy. For some, could be pretty difficult. <clears throat> so if we're looking at this example, we see that um, 150 to 400 uh, calories per hour, 30 to 50 grams per hour, along with uh, carbohydrate, and then 5 to 10 grams of protein. This is to help keep us an amino acid pool in, in your body to hopefully help maintain and not break down too much protein where it might see a bit of an amino acid pool coming in. So as an example here, if someone did run a 430 marathon time, we're looking at because there's such a wide scale of calories here, anywhere from 675 to 1800 calories for a race. Now that could be for a lot of different reasons. We could have someone that is a fair size runner. I've I had a a, a pretty big uh, dude that was a uh, ultra runner and um, he would need a gigantic amount of calories just because he, it's a bigger engine that he has to fuel. Um, carbohydrates here, anywhere from 135 to 225 over the course of the four and a half hours. And then protein, pretty moderate stuff, nothing that should be too hard to try to achieve. 
from anywhere from 22 and a half to 45 grams. So nothing too big on, on protein. So some race day foods. Now, when it comes to race day, not just the loading, but during the race is going to be times again to try to achieve some of the, uh, the foods that you're going to be consuming, right? To try to get enough energy, enough carbohydrates. So you're not just going to get that from energy gels or goo or just um, drinking some sports drinks. That's going to come through some consumption as well when it comes to different foods. So I try to list 10 different things here that are pretty common and common suggestions that I have for marathon runners and different levels of calories that some of them are going to have and different contributions to uh, carbohydrates, protein, fat, and uh, we see um, sodium and potassium here. So we'll, we're going to get into the electrolytes soon, but to see that we can get those relatively easy, but again, it's going to depend on what that means for you. So to not just rely on one thing. So we kind of get that, that, that diet fatigue, that food fatigue. I'm just eating the same stuff. Like yeah, it's boring and it just, you get over it. And those are different kind of mechanisms that the body's going to have to stop you from over consuming. So you can see here, there's different foods, different calories. Again, this might be something for you to take a screenshot with. Um, and whatever foods that you like, that you know that work well for you is going to be really beneficial. Outside of the recommendations that I have, if you do have stuff that you feel good when you consume, whether it's day of or during your race, then that's stuff to pay attention to and to see how that food is made up. And if there's other foods just that are like it, so you don't get into that diet fatigue. So we see that some of the foods have much higher sodium and potassium versus others here. So, so now <clears throat> we're going to get into cheers, hydration and dehydration. So this piece here, I think is super fascinating to me. Always has been where we can have something like water that can be as beneficial as it is when it comes to performance, cooling our bodies, all that stuff. And we don't, many of us don't do a great job of consuming it. So when we get into dehydration, again, we've, I'm sure some of you probably already know a lot of this, but uh, to think about the, the, once we are dehydrated, we get into decreased thermal regulation, cardiovascular drift. So heart rate kind of goes up because of the decrease in blood plasma. We have to, the heart has to work harder to get cells to the site that have oxygen in them. And then to be able to clear that uh, waste products that you develop out. And it's doing it with less blood plasma because it, water is a giant constituent of that, right? So without water or decreased amount of water, it makes things harder and harder. And it's like this giant, like down, downward spiral of performance. The more dehydrated you get, the harder things get, the more dehydrated you get, and it just drives. So um, there's also an increased risk of injury, illness, um, higher risk of dehydration, hot human conditions. As you guys know, when you sweat more, you lose more water. And it can happen in colder temperatures because there's less of a drinking response when it's cold. And also, um, it's super important, as important as hydration is, only about 20% of runners really monitor their hydration. <clears throat> so again, keeping to our 150 pound example that we had for our 68 kilo, we look at one to two, we're gonna look at different levels of dehydration. We have one to 2%, which is mild, two to 5% moderate amount of dehydration and greater than 5% um, is gonna be severe. So this is percentage of lost weight from your body weight. So for example, one to 2% would be one, 1. 1.5 to three pounds, two to five is three to seven pounds, and then greater than five, percent is going to be greater than seven pounds lost if this person in this example of 150 pounders. So what that means is mild dehydration. We've all experienced it. I'm kind of experiencing it kind of right now. And I'm not really active where we're thinking about um, experiencing thirst, reduce saliva production and decreased urine output. So our body's trying to hang on to that, the, the water to try to think about the stress that the body is going under right now. And there's a slight decrease, or excuse me, slight increase in heart rate because there's a decrease in blood plasma. 
which we just kind of spoke about. And then this starts that downward spiral because we begin to have a bit a small issue in regulating temperature. And then with performance, we see that alertness drops. So with alertness, less concentration, you're probably not going to be focused on your gait and uh, your the how you're actually going to be uh, performing your run, which will run into kind of bleeding power and not performing the way you should. Moderate dehydration, um, there's a significant loss of blood plasma. We get into increased um, drift when it comes to your heart rate. And then also a drop in blood pressure. Again, that starts to become a problem. You know, some people experience some some dizziness, some headaches. Um, and as we kind of go on, we see that this is where we're going to see some quickly spiral and some decline in performance. So if you start to notice later in runs, if you're not consuming enough uh, fluid, that we're going to see a strong decline in performance and then uh, strength pretty much across the board. When it comes to dehydration, we're going to lose performance. Um, very important to make sure that we're really on point when it comes to uh, the dehydration process here. And then severe dehydration. This is where things get really dangerous. And kind of like when you think of um, professional fighters cutting weight, where we see, we've seen even greater losses in this by far. But we think about how dangerous this really can be, where we see a substantial loss in blood plasma, where it just the heart's working even harder. Um, there's big uh, reductions in blood pressure and uh, there's a lot less blood flow to the skin. So we can't get rid of some of the, the heat. You can't really move to the surface nearly as it is. So we start to see an increase in core temperature. And a lot of times that starts to compound the issues of GI issues. And then also we can, if we, this continues, we get into kidney function impairment and, uh, and let alone, I'm not even really concerned, honestly, about the performance effects. This is where things get dangerous. But if we are thinking about the performance here, we get severe cramping, nausea, vomiting, and the disorientation and confusion where you've seen people on the finish line and sometimes people just look like they were in an absolute train wreck. Um, and a lot of times when it comes to hydration, it's going to be important for us to really nail this down of anything. If anyone gets anything from this, I, I hope it's the, uh, the hydration piece here. So hyponatremia is a loss too much of a loss in sodium. Now what this is going to signal is going to be a, a cell swelling because it just sees that the sodium levels drop too far. And uh, we run into a host of issues of from headache, fatigue, nausea, seizures, and even death where, uh, and it's, I don't want to overstate this. Uh, sorry, I can't stress it enough where th this is going to be a giant issue because most people that are trying to live a really healthy lifestyle typically eat pretty low sodium because they just see that as, uh, as not healthy. When that couldn't be further from the truth, we see that we really need, especially those of you that are going to be training and the weather's warming up, so you're going to be sweating more. There's going to be a loss of sodium through sweat, through urine, especially when you're consuming a lot of water without, replenish, uh, re without uh, replenishing um, your electrolytes. And I've noticed it with runners that I've aided as well when it comes to uh, they're get, giving them a nutrition plan where they didn't add any electrolytes to their, uh, to their water. And they just end up going to the bathroom more and more and more. They, as one example, they stopped a lot during the race. Um, we have to be really mindful of the importance of some of these um, micronutrients. So like sodium, so it's, as, as the mineral, we need a lot of it in terms of, of, uh, of intake when it comes to any kind of higher sweat rates. So 300, 300 to 600 milligrams of sodium equals about one to two grams of table salt in one liter of water. So what I want you to do is take a gram of salt. So weigh that out on your, on your food scale, put it in a liter of water, shake it up. And it's a <laughs> It's tough to get through at first until you really start to train yourself to be able to consume that. Two grams is going to be, that's going to be a lot. Like that's, 
for a lot of people, I, no, I'm not a giant fan of it being that salty, but to try to find a way to consume more sodium is going to be very, very valuable. But we've seen with the, the food slide that there's some foods we can take that are going to be pretty high in sodium too. So it's to find your balance between adding sodium to your water. And some advice that I've given people in the past is have that sodium solution, but you'd have, say, if in your Camelback, you would have like your regular, like your water, you would have a sodium solution as a bottle to kind of go through or vice versa, where on your back is your sodium solution and that you, uh, and then at the checkpoints where you would consume just water. And there's a bunch of different ways we can approach that. Again, everyone's really different. So what happens sometimes is that uh, athletes are going to under consume water um, because of the higher um, sodium need that goes on. So hydration strategies don't start in hydration debt. So be hydrated before your event. That's going to be very, very important. And to remember that electrolytes are really going to matter. So drinking to thirst on the daily is going to be key to trying to stay hydrated. We can use this pretty much every day, except for really hard training days. Now, how we can approach this maybe a bit more in detail when it comes to your training is water weighs one gram, uh, one kilo per liter of water uh, per sorry water weighs one kilo per liter I'll try that again and then what you can do is weigh yourself before your run and then after your your training and you can replace 150 percent of the weight that you lost in kilos by per liter so if you lost a kilo then we would try to replace 150 percent of that of lost weight. A hundred percent. So if you lost a kilo drinking just one liter of water, isn't going to cut it because there's still sweating that still happens after, um, even though maybe you've stopped training, we've all kind of experienced that. Um, I did yesterday, but, um, and 200 is unnecessary, like 150. That's kind of like the Goldilocks where replacing 150% of your lost weight in water is going to be beneficial to help you, um, rehydrate. Uh, got all this here. So thinking of your sweat rate is right here. So thinking of the weight that you've lost in grams plus the fluid that you consumed. Um, and then just divide that by the number of minutes that you train to give you your milliliters per minute that you that you should probably consume. So not something I expect you guys to do all the time, but I think that on certain days would be pretty important to do this once in a while to see exactly how much fluid you've lost and to on your own personal sweat rate where I'm not a super sweaty person until it gets hot and then things kind of go off the charts. So I would make sure that if I were to, to, to do it, um, I would do it during those times that maybe my event would, would happen. And then we can see to try to keep things just on pace. So to kind of pace your, your consumption of 450 to 750 milliliters per hour, uh, dividing that up even further, kind of like bring that down even further of 150, 250 milliliters every 20 minutes or so. And again, remembering our, uh, our, so our uh, sodium solution. So probably a part of what you guys came in to, to hear would, would be the supplements and ergogenic aid. So an ergogenic aid is anything that can aid performance. So that's not just supplement. It's any strategy, anything mechanic. So any strategy like a training strategy or like a nutrition strategy, um, anything mechanical like a knee brace or anything like that, anything that can help at all, that can help improve your performance, even meditation um, is going to be classified as an ergogenic aid. Um, but supplements is what we're going to really touch on because we can talk about the other stuff for forever. They have some pretty cool uh, new stuff that has come out. Um. Caffeine, probably everyone's favorite. I don't really know a person that uh, doesn't really consume much caffeine, very few. Um, now, when it comes to caffeine, we think about what uh, maybe some people might um, believe is that we used to, to think that caffeine was um, a really powerful diuretic where we would get rid of, we would have a lot of water loss or like lose water weight quickly with caffeine. But we know that that's just not the case. And even as recent as the 11th of this month, the 11th of March, 2024, for whoever might be watching later, um, another research paper that was released by a colleague of mine 
And uh, we see that that was very clearly indicated. Um, and even that that effect of you of caffeine kind of being any kind of uh, diuretic is that it'll it is dissipated quite a bit, especially with uh, habitual use. So some of you that do use caffeine daily, really that water loss effect is honestly a moot point. It's really nothing to really be concerned about. Um, now thinking about the benefits of caffeine, I have a very short list of supplements that are really beneficial, to be honest. We have all kinds that are, that can be, that we, we see out there and that aren't really, they don't really have much in line of research behind them. Now, the one thing is if there's something that you're taking that you think boosts your performance, um, well, I don't care if it does or it doesn't. If you think it does and you improve your performance, it's improved your performance. So, but caffeine is on that short list of, it helps most populations of athletes, whether it's going to be speed, power, average power, sprint performance, mood. A big one for you runners is reduced perceived exertion. So how hard something feels. And then also may, um, this, another big one for you guys is decreased muscle pain perception um, is going to be very valuable. Now, one thing that I didn't cover, because again, I'm not a doctor or pharmacist, but when it comes to taking things like, um, like Advil or NSAIDs, uh, it's really important to be careful of what that can do when it comes, because, you know, muscle pain happens, especially during those events, but that can have a, a, an impact on your, on your gut in this case. Okay. So with regular, when it comes to regular con consumers, uh, um, you're going to be, there's going to be a reduced, uh, ergogenic benefit. So the more you take, the less it kind of works. So if you want to use caffeine as a, in, in, in the idea of performance, you should go through a bit of a bout of not consuming it before you end up using it. So we call that a washout period. So washout period, typically 10 days to two, to, uh, to two weeks. And then you end up consuming it before the event begins again to really highlight the benefits of caffeine. Now, the ergogenic dose of caffeine, so the performance enhancing dose of caffeine is three to six milligrams per kilo of body weight. So for the 68 kilo example, we're looking at 204 to 408 milligrams of caffeine. Now, for some, this might be a lot. For some, it might just be what, you know, Tuesday morning. But I think it's really important, again, especially this, don't drive up your caffeine because you see, okay, well, it's 408. If I weigh 150 pounds, I can have 408 milligrams. That, you, that might not be tolerated really well. So it's going to be very important to understand that this is going to be something that's very, again, very individualized. And then to consume it 30 to 90 minutes before. But for your purposes, a lot of times the caffeine, I don't really think it's super necessary. The first, you know, right before your event to be all amped up to go. I feel like the jitters and everything else that you guys get before a race is like, is quite enough. So if you were to consume caffeine, just one technique might be to use it where you know you typically have a drop in performance. Everyone has different kind of, has different ebb and flow when it comes to performance over a long period of time. So to try to time it where you're going to, hit that about an hour before that's when you would consume your caffeine to have that little maybe jump to not get that lull in your performance. One thing that's very important to understand um, and which came from the, the research paper that my colleague did um, is the sodium loss during with caffeine. Now there's not a big water loss when, with caffeine, but there is more sodium loss. So we're going to have to balance the effect of you cons making sure that you're consuming enough sodium for your performance and your health when it comes to uh, longer events, but also balancing that with the caffeine that you're going to be consuming. Oh, and one more piece on caffeine is that there is a carbohydrate sparing effect there as well. So there's like the yin yang of losing sodium, but helping to spare your carbohydrates. So again, if you're consuming enough sodium, it's nothing really to be worried about, but the benefit for your, the, uh, the carbohydrate sparing is going to be there as well. Creatine. Creatine, honestly, I think is such an important supplement 
And if it would come out today, I think that everyone would be thinking that I'm full of crap when it comes to its benefits. Now, the list is so long that I couldn't even put it all on here. And we're seeing it, creatine is the most widely studied uh, ergogenic supplement there is out there. And it does a whole host of amazing things. Um, and it is super safe, which is great. Now, the typical kind of dose, I don't really normally get people to do like a loading dose of any kind. Just take three to five grams. Um, it just takes about you know three to four weeks for most people to be, really be saturated with the, with creatine. Now, what it does is it's going to help with a whole host of performance benefits, um, all the way from something that might be more beneficial for you guys when it comes to high high intensity exercise capacity, but also gaining in lean uh, lean body mass, um, helping with power output, strength. Some people used to believe that it would dehydrate you, we actually see the opposite. We see an improved hydration status with it. Um, some amazing research that's being done on creatine when it comes to aged populations and uh, neurocognitive function is pretty, pretty impressive. And then there's other functions as well that uh, we see some other studies being performed when it comes to um, mood in, in teenage boys, uh, when they're when they are suffering from from depression there are so many benefits with creatine you would if it would come out now you would think that i'm full of it but the idea that creatine is even just on its uh, the creatine monohydrate like i've got some right here um just the plain old creatine monohydrate not the expensive creatine ethyl ester or anything like that just take the plain jane making sure that it's um it's a pure creatine and you'll be good. It's very inexpensive considering the performance benefits that you get. Um, these are great when it comes to like the, the uh, electrolyte tabs. I think this is a great space for, for you guys. Now, we've already talked about sodium. That's why I didn't want to repeat too much again. But just a convenient way to achieve your electrolyte goals. I think it's they're, they taste great. More palatable than just a sodium solution. And... You can, in the same little um, container, you can put different flavors in there. So you're not just, so you can kind of like stack the flavors where you have one and then a different flavor and kind of like, you know, go uh, in a different uh, pattern there just so you can get away from the food fatigue. So you can continue. So you're not just having like berry blast, for example, and just kind of getting over it. You can have different flavors um, so you can get away from the food fatigue and it's pre-measured, it's accurate, it's easy, it's super convenient. So one tab and 475 mils of water, again, this is gonna help with hydration balance, but everyone's different in the amount of hydration that they're gonna need. So amino acids, this one we're not gonna get too, too crazy on. Um, just what I wanted to cover was more so the ones in blue. These are conditionally essential amino acids. So now we have essential amino acids. These are ones that we need to get from diet. So we can't make this on our own. Our bodies can't make it. Non-essential, our bodies can make these on its own. Basically, we take in food. It's going to make, it's going to take little pieces and it's going to make these amino acids. Now, amino acids are little building blocks of protein. So the green ones here are the branch chain amino acids. And then these are the essential amino acids. So we used to think that branched chain amino acids was the end all and be all. We know that's really not the case. Um, taking essential amino acids, not super important if you're going to be consuming uh, enough protein. Again, getting your daily protein requirements. If you are getting enough, you don't have to supplement, especially with branched chain amino acids. But the other side of that, if you're consuming more fluid by taking in branched chain amino acids, then hydration status matters, right? But we can see that if you're taking essential amino acids, some people like, to, I'd like to get people to experiment with taking EAAs during a race. So maybe you don't want to consume protein. Everyone's a bit different. So again, individualized. So the ones that are in blue here are conditionally essential, uh, uh, essential where we need to get more of them in cases of stress, hard exercise and illness. So 
if we can get these supplements when we know that we're going to be going really hard, obviously during a marathon, to try to get through the, some of those, these become more and more crucial as time goes on. And some of these are we're going to be responsible for energy production and um, also your immune function as well. So maybe some of you that have have experienced, I know some of you have gone through tons of training and then you know get the sniffles, you kind of feel run down a bit. Well, that's when something like glutamine is going to be pretty important. It's, it's the most abundant amino acid in the body, but not really as beneficial as we used to think it was. So, but during times of high stress, hard exercise or during illness, then it can become very beneficial. Um, especially glutamine can be a very important part of the immune function. It's going to be important fuel for your, um, for your, uh, immune system. Um, a real different one that we used to use a lot back in the day, just plain old baking soda, sodium bicarbonate. Now, this is one that I'm going to caution everybody on. I think that pe people should try it, but the dose is pretty dramatic. We're looking at 20 grams for someone that weighs 68 kilos, so 150 pounds. So it does a great job of what it does. It can boost performance in high intensity cycling, running, all that good stuff, but it just, the dose is kind of high. Now, if you common side effects, especially when you take the dose all at once and you're not used to taking it, bloating, this like the nausea, the vomiting, not so much, but sometimes cramping um, with low incidence. Now, we can kind of mitigate that by separating the dose, low, keeping the dose fairly low, and then kind of working our way up again, just training things. And it's going to help with the, that boost in performance by buffering uh, the, the some of the waste products that we're going to be producing during those runs. So I want to take the time to thank some amazing people, um, all the researchers that are involved that no one ever hears about and that we get our information from to be able to present to you, but then also to help you perform your best. Some of these people I'm fortunate enough to call colleagues and friends. And um, I'm just really excited to, I just, this was a big piece. I wanted to get to this before uh, we, we signed out. Um, I think it's really valuable to, we stand on the shoulders of giants and some of these people are amazing humans and, uh, and great researchers, of course. So um, now if you guys have any questions, I would love to field them if you, uh, if you have any. No, oh, awesome. Okay, well, that is it. I appreciate your time so much. Um, I know we covered a lot and we're gonna be putting this uh, up on YouTube so you guys can uh, have a peek at any time and take the pieces that are, are the most important to you. Anyways, I hope you all have an amazing night. Thank you so much for, uh, for, for the time. Really appreciate it. And I am out. <laughs>